Okay. Well, we are continuing our study on the fruit of the Spirit this week as we uh, now are on our sixth out of nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. That's our study tonight. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's what Galatians 5, 21 and, or 22 and 23 say. And so I want us to talk about goodness tonight. Uh, why do you ask me what is good? That's a question that Jesus asked in Matthew 19, verse 17, when a young man came up to him and asked him, Teacher, what good deed must I do to receive eternal life? He thought that if he did all the right things, that he would be able to attain this goal. So Jesus asked him, why do you ask me what is good? Or uh, in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, uh, the way that it says is, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But I think it's important as we think about this question, you know, it's a question that I think it reverberates all the way back to the opening pages of the Bible. How do you know what is good? How do we know what is good? Again, that's something that, read Genesis 1 through 3, that's a pressing, pressing question. Uh, if you go to the opening pages of Genesis 1, God creates things, and we hear this refrain again and again, he created this and he saw that it was good. And then on day 6, after he's created everything, right before his rest, he says, and he saw it, that it was very good. So God creates good things, but in chapter 2, as he makes these humans, uh, he creates, you know, these, he puts them in the garden and there's these trees and there's the tree of life and the man has, and the woman, they have freedom to eat from it. But then there's also a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they're told not to eat from that. And the day they eat it, that they shall surely die. And of course, we know in Genesis 3, that's exactly what they do. But we have to think about it. There was a period where they didn't know. Okay, there was a... Uh, we might describe it as a state of innocence, or I, I think it would be better to think of it as a state of dependence upon the Lord. So if they do what God had called them to do, and being fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and to do it, to work and to keep the garden, uh, then they, that's, that's a life of faith. It's a life of trust. But instead, they wanted what only God had. And moreover, once they received that knowledge, what did it do for them? Right? What did, what did having the knowledge of good and evil do for Adam and Eve? Well, first, it induced guilt and shame. Right? Suddenly, they knew that they were naked, and even though it was just the two of them, they thought that they needed to cover up. They needed to hide from God. But also, it becomes very clear in that episode and for reading the rest of the Bible that knowing what is good and knowing what is evil does not give us the power to do what is good. Uh, seems like we know what good and evil are, but still humans keep choosing to do bad things. So uh, knowing what's good and evil, we stop asking the question. You ask me, why do you ask me what is good? We need to know this. And again, uh, apart from God's help, we aren't able to do this. But, you know, as we think about the Bible's history, we think about human history, we continue to see sin's deleterious effects. The fact that it just keeps working on people. It keeps... You know, uh, you know the all it takes is the, it's an era like the Gilded Age. Okay, so the late eighteen hundreds, the early nineteen hundreds, where there's this kind of this modern hope, this utopianism that hey, with all this new technology that we have, we are going to pretty soon we're going to fix all the world's problems. You know, a piston is a pretty amazing thing, and then when you put bullets in that piston, in World War One. Well, you see just how much carnage you can do. How many millions of lives can be lost so quickly. You know, again, you finish one war, we, well, okay, that was just a hiccup, we put it behind us, and you have another war, right? Six million Jews slaughtered. And that's, you know, I don't, some of you, that's during some of your all's lifetime. You know, I still think, you know, when I was born, and I, it'll be interesting to teach in future generations about this, right? But when I was born, it was less than 50 years from the end of World War II. I know some of y'all were <laughs> alive during that time, but, you know, still, less than 50 years from when the atom bomb was dropped. And I was born, it was only 23 years after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Right now I'm 30, right? So now it's 53 years ago. 
but it's just crazy how uh again the and we again the we this is 2021 we lived through 2020 together and uh we've continued to see tragedies uh <coughs> It all started with Adam and Eve, and we still have these kind of two lingering questions. The first one is, how do we know what is good? Or I guess rather this just says, what is good and how do we know that? And second, how can we do what is good? And if you've read the Bible, any honest reader of the Bible, honest reader of the Bible knows the Bible's not mute on those questions. It's not silent. It talks about that a lot. Uh, and I think especially as we read the Gospels, we see Jesus treating people like moral agents, like people who should know, they can know what is right from wrong, and that they should do right. God, Jesus uh, treats them as agents. There's one uh, Baptist distinctive, I, I don't really think it ever gets a lot of press, but it's called soul competency, right? And really the, what, what that means is that each person, each man, each woman, each child, <laughs> has the wherewithal themselves to stand before God and is, and is personally accountable to God. Not what somebody else has done to me or what someone else says about me, but I, as an individual human being, have an, have an accountability to God. And I, again, I'm competent to be held before Him. But as we think about how it's a fr goodness as a fruit of the Spirit, I don't want us to just focus on the bad. As we think about goodness... Uh, it's something, like all the fruit of the Spirit, it's something that is inerrant to God that He shares with us. It's something that is inerrant to God that He communicates, that He shares to us. And like all the other fruit, it's something that we receive by the Holy Spirit through our faith in Jesus Christ. And so I want us to start the same way we've always done this, by thinking about God. What does it mean for God to be good? We hear this refrain in the Psalms, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Or... We think of uh, this constant refrain we hear, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Normally, then it goes on, For His steadfast love endures forever. I do want to note, just from the outset, last week we talked about kindness. This week we're talking about goodness. And these things are inherently related as we, as we talk about this. One of the key verses we looked at last week was Titus 3, 4. And it says, when, And when the goodness... <laughs> And loving kindness of our Lord appeared. So those two things are together. But last week we looked at whenever we hear the steadfast love of the Lord, we're thinking about his kindness. So give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his goodness, for his steadfast love, his kindness endures forever. So these, I just want us to notice how uh, these are all connected. And I think God's goodness is manifested towards us primarily in his holiness and his righteousness. Uh, in one of the things it means for God to be good is that it's impossible for him to be bad or evil. He is the opposite of that. Uh, but I think we look at him and think that all of his words and all of his works are good for us. Uh, and I want us to look, kind of break that down to a couple of uh, different categories. The first is that God's creation is good. God's creation is good. And so, again, we talked about this already. Genesis chapter 1, verse, uh, hold on, there's a lot of verses, six times. Uh, God saw that it was good. God created something. He saw that it was good. And it's there's a temptation, and this has really been a, a temptation that has been around forever, to treat creation as something that's bad. That's actually one of the early heresies that the first Christians had to combat, was you had these people, these Greek philosophers, and they said, well, there's a physical realm and a spiritual realm, and all the physical stuff is bad. Part of our... What we hope, and this is, if you've ever heard of the heresy of Gnosticism, it's one of its pillars is that part of our Christian liberation is to be free from our bodies and to be free from any physical attachments so that we can eventually live in this spiritual existence. Now you think, wasn't that what the Bible says? No. The Bible uh, does talk about heaven, this place we go when we die, but it also its emphasis is the resurrection, right? Why would God, if God didn't care about his creation, why would the Son of God assume human flesh? Right? Not as a created being, but as he stepped into his creation. And why would he then, after the, his breath expires and he dies, why would he come back in the flesh? And why would he promise us a new heavens and a new earth? So God's creation is good. Uh, we see, again, some counter-teaching about this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul says, Anything, Everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is to be received if it is received with thanksgiving, for it's made holy by the word of God and prayer. 
And we want to draw a pretty clear distinction between God's creation being used for evil things and God's creation in and of itself, right, as a good thing. And the Bible even says that God's good creations, they bless all human beings, whether they're Christians or not, whether they are faithful to him and they trust Jesus Christ or not. Acts chapter 14, one of the, that's one of the ways that Paul evangelizes the pagans at Lystra as he says, listen, Y'all never heard about God, but like he still was controlling the wind and the rain and the seasons, and he still brought you food and crops and harvest because God's creation is good. And he shares that goodness with everyone. That's the phrase for that, maybe common grace, grace that is for every human being, regardless of their relationship to Jesus. So God's creation is good. Also, we want to say that God's deeds, his actions are good. So again, we think of these three categories, his holiness, his righteousness, his goodness. They're distinct, but they are all related. So God's holiness is just his total otherness. And that's maybe a weird way to describe it, but it just means that he's set apart in a category all to himself. I think of, again, I've been reading Exodus. So I think of Exodus chapter 19, uh, whenever they, the people gather at Mount Sinai, before Moses goes up and before they gather at the foot, they are to basically purify themselves for six days. Okay, so cleanse yourselves, don't eat unclean things, you know, uh, abstain from sexual relations, abstain from touching blood before you come to the mountain. Why? Because God is holy. God's ark is holy. I was talking to someone recently about 2 Kings chapter 6. I think it's 2 Kings 6 verse 8. And, but it, no, nah, but it might be somewhere else. Actually, uh, uh, it's in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 6. Uh, and uh, Uzziah, Uzzah, not Uzziah. It's the famous story, right? He's walking behind the Ark of the Covenant. It's on a cart, and it stumbles, and he touches it, and he dies. And you think, well, what? That seems so severe. I, there's two things going on there. One is that God commanded Israel that the Ark should be covered, should be carried and transported with long poles so that no one would touch it. And then someone touched it. They touched God's holiness. It's dangerous to them. But part of that holiness means that God is perfect. That there is no, uh, uh, the biblical words are escaping, but there's no, there's no hint or even shadow of evil within God. His righteousness means that it talks about his moral uprightness, his perfect justice. And again, in the Bible, justice and righteousness are really kind of just different variations of the same thing within God. Uh, the two sides of the same coin may be applied in different spheres, but they're the same thing. And then again, his goodness is his perfection. And another way in which God is good is that he takes evil and he turns it into good. Now, one of the ways we see this is redemption, right? God, even though we've sinned, he doesn't, he provides a way of salvation for us. But even in Genesis 50, right, we have this famous line from Joseph after his, his father's passed away and, you know, his brothers are scared that he's going to turn on him now that their dad's gone. And he says, well, listen, what you did was bad. Not going to deny that. It was terrible. But what God, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, uh, that his people would be saved. And so, I mean, that, that we could apply that maybe hastily in some circumstances, right? Something bad happens, and our first thing is like, well, you know, God's going to use something good, you know? It's like, well, yeah, but let's not put a smile on it too fast, you know? When COVID hit the world, maybe God can do something good with that. I believe that's true, but, like, we don't want to gleefully walk out the building and skipping saying, yay for COVID, right? We, there's so much harm that comes with it. It's only in retrospect we can observe those things in which his goodness comes through, how he used it. But I think it's the way we see this the most is in the cross, where Jesus killed death by death, okay, by dying, by, by taking God's wrath for us. He ultimately defeated death for us by him coming up out of the tomb. God takes something evil, even the death of his own son, and using it for good, for our good. So we know that the Lord is good, and again, this is a fruit that he communicates to us. Let us not grow weary in doing good. This is what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, right after the fruit of the Spirit. So I want you to think about that. So he talks about the works of the flesh, and then he moves into the fruit of the Spirit and says, and let us walk by the Spirit, if indeed we keep in step with the Spirit. And then in Galatians chapter 6, he just starts talking about what it means to do that together as the people of God. You know, bearing with one another, bearing one another's burdens. And then he goes on to say at the end of that chapter, let us not grow weary of doing good. Right? And, and then he, the next verse, so then as we have an opportunity, let us do good to everyone. 
especially to those who are the household of faith. And the Bible in the Old Testament and the New is replete with exhortations for us to do good things. Sometimes that's in the exhortation of a commandment. You know, do, you shall do this, you shall not do that. Or throughout the New Testament, there's this continual exhortation to do, do good things. And so I want us to think about what it means for us as we meditate upon God, meditating upon what is good, kind of in the thought realm, and then moving to actions. So the first thing we want to meditate upon what is good. Uh, this is something that Paul exhorts the churches to in multiple places. And Philippians 4.8 is a verse, you're not going to see the word good anywhere in here, but he's only describing good things. So I think it really encapsulates this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now just to, again, I, I say this as a, as a point for us, but also as we think about discipling the younger generations. When I was like 13 years old, I had a Sunday school teacher do a Sunday school lesson on this. He was our middle school youth pastor. And I don't know why. I don't know why the Spirit chose this verse, but for the next five years of my life, that was in seventh grade, for the next five years of my life, it was a verse that my closest friends and I would go to. We would say it to one another. As we're thinking, as we're trying to grow in the faith, as we're trying to mature, whatever is good, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is commendable, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is pure, any excellence, think about these things. And I, I say that because we, we need to meditate upon these good things, right, to focus on that. You've probably heard it say before, you are what you eat. My, my favorite commercial to illustrate this is, you know, the commercial where Someone's eating a donut, and then they're like coming up the escalator, and they've got like two donuts right here, you know. They get a, twink, get a twinkie, and then they got like you know twinkies under their arms. That commercial is probably like ten or fifteen years old, but I think it's it's a classic one. We need to think about what we consume, but not just by way of food, right? Because we are body, soul, people. We've got uh, we you know we have a mind, we have emotions, and all these things affect us. So what we consume by way of our food, but even I say by what we read, by what we uh, watch on television, what movies we watch, by what we click on on the internet, by what we, even the friendships that we spend time with, they're going to have an effect upon us whether we realize it or not. And the, the warning for us is we normally don't realize it. I was talking, I was reading about idolatry recently and they said, you know, the dangerous thing about idolatry is that you never know when you're, when you're doing idolatry. Right? If you knew, you wouldn't do it. But we, we, and I think 1 John 5 ends that way. You know, you have 1 John, this beautiful letter on the love of God and Christian living together and the doctrine of who Jesus is. And it ends with this last, you know, it almost seems like a throwaway line. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Which also is not a good thing. But we need to do, think about good things. Now, we want to be careful because, again, we, it doesn't mean that we only consume G-rated content, right? And again, and I think we even should expand that when we use the word consume, like if I'm going to watch a movie, that I'm only watching it for entertainment value to get a couple chuckles and then I can you know, go to bed at the end of it. Uh, but it, I think it primarily means that we think about the things of God. Okay, we, we do be, we are careful about what we, you know, take in. I, I don't watch overly violent movies. I don't watch, you know, movies that are all kinds of nastiness in them. I have friends who did that when I was younger, and you could tell how that affected their actions. I just couldn't approve of that. But um, but we want to think about God. And I, again, to quote another passage from Paul, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. You know, I don't think, whenever Paul says don't not to think about the things of earth, he's not saying, you know, you've heard the phrase, that he's so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. That's not what he's encouraging us to do. But he's encouraging us to think about God. Things of heavenly things, where Christ is. Think about Jesus. Right? Think about the fact that Jesus reigns and that he will return. And allow that to affect our actions. So we want to meditate upon God. We want to meditate upon what is good to set our minds there. But also we want, again, we can't ever let it just stay in the mental space, right? We, we have to translate it to our actions. And so we need to do good. And in that same passage in Colossians, 
he encourages them to meditate on the things that are above, and then for the next 12 verses, he just talks about different ways in which we put off the old person who was all of our evil deeds and to put on the new man who's being renewed in the image of Jesus. And so I think this, uh, how do we do good as the people of God? If we're thinking of the fruit of the Spirit, how is it going to bear fruit in our lives? How can we see the buds on the tree, the, the fruit that you can pick and eat and present to God? Well, first, I think by means of personal righteousness, right? As we might think of this in terms of Christian morality, goodness, integrity, right? It means that we are moral in regards to our speech, with regard to our bodies, our sexuality, and our behavior towards others and our interpersonal relationships. You know, you go to the Ten Commandments to not envy, you know, be in this person, not be a person who steals or murders or, you know, to not consume with passion. Again, that's on the personal level. Why we want to resist temptation and not, not give way to temptation. But also, we do good whenever we pursue justice. And I want to read a passage from the Bible today. Right? Uh, at any honest reading of the Bible, I was hearing someone talk about this yesterday uh, in an interview. And he said, you know, so much of the Old Testament didn't make sense to me until I realized that what God's talking about is not just interpersonal relationships, but he's talking about societal justice in a lot of these places. Right, and to put this in the terms of goodness, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. Think about the goodness of God. What is good and what does the Lord Yahweh require of you but to do justice, do justice, love mercy, love compassion, love that loving kindness of God, that covenant love, and to walk humbly with thy God. I preached last fall from Amos, and Amos has this very famous passage where you know, uh, the people are wanting God to act. You know, the day of the Lord. We want the day of the Lord to come. Come on, God, do something big. Deliver us from our enemies. He says, well, why do you, why are you calling for the day of the Lord? Listen, whenever you offer your sacrifices to God, he does not see them. He does not hear your praises. He does not smell the sacrifices. Because he wants justice to flow down like waters and righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. And this society that had gross inequity and uh, again, I think there is much uh, import to our society today, but even in Isaiah 58, and I want to read this, because uh, in, as Baptists, one of the spiritual disciplines we don't talk about often is fasting, but he's talking about a true and righteous fast in Isaiah 58. I was reading this this morning in my quiet time, and, and he says this, is, not, is this not the fast that I choose, Isaiah 56, 58 verse 6? Is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see him naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the lord shall be your rear guard then you shall cry you shall call and the lord will answer you shall cry and he will say here i am if you take away the yoke from your midst and the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness if you pour yourself out for the hungry satisfy the desire of the afflicted then you sure then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday God expects his people to care about righteousness. And again, an even more direct passage maybe to read, and this is more on the God is not happy in, uh, Isaiah chapter 1, right? And to see, it, I, I don't think it requires a master's degree in Bible reading to understand what's going on in Isaiah 1. I'm just seeing the wickedness of the society, the injustice at hand, and how the people who are supposed to be God's people are not addressing it. And again, I think there's a call for us to address these things. So we pursue justice as the people of God, and also we continue to do God even while others mock. So again, we always again we if we know anything about the history of the people of God, whenever they do good, often they get pushed back. Uh, you know, if you want to get a jump start on the sermon for Sunday, go read Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. <laughs> Uh, the rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2, which I'll be preaching on this Sunday, you'll see exactly that. But we're encouraged as the people of God to continue to do good, even if we might suffer and to endure through that. First Peter 
whenever we uh, had the sermon series on that last uh, spring, uh, we saw that a lot. And it's almost like there's a, this. It's almost like there's a, a like a theme that just keeps on getting emphasized again and again through the letter, and that is just hit on the different notes every time. And to just read two of the verses here, 1 Peter 3, 17 and 4, 19, Peter says, It's better to suffer for doing good so that no one may boast. Or sorry, I just jumped lines. Uh, for suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, then for doing evil. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to the faithful creator while doing good. So keep doing good. Even if the world you know, says you're a fool, even if they mock you, do good, you know, don't suffer for doing bad stuff, you know, again, I think uh, sometimes I see Christians misbehaving in public uh, very loudly in the news, and you know, and then people criticize them, and they say, oh, it's just persecution, you know, I'm just being faithful, and I'm like, no, you're being a blockhead, you're being wicked, you know, that's why people are criticizing you, uh, so we want to be faith, suffer even while doing good, we do good even while we suffer. And, and while we think about goodness, we want to remember, and I just think this is always key, is that we do good things as a result of our salvation, not to earn our salvation. And again, just the, this famous biblical passage, Ephesians 2, 8-9, through 9, For it is by grace that you are saved through faith. It is, is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. But then what's the next line? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so, as we do good works, again, we it's, it's, it's not so much of, well, I'm doing this in order to earn God's pleasure. Even as a Christian, right, I can kind of have this mentality of, but I still have to be the best. I still need to repay God for all that he's done for me. But rather, it's out of an overflow of thankfulness and abundance, understanding that I'm just living into the calling that God has placed upon my life. Uh, and again, I, as this, I mentioned this last week on kindness. I think this is probably true about all the fruit. You know, we don't just do good things, right? We become good people. And I don't mean it in the sense that, well, he's good people, so to speak, right? He doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't chew, doesn't run with those who do. I know good people who do those things. You know, I may wouldn't prefer they do them, but I know good people who do those things. But rather, they love people. They, they do that. So, uh, you know, one, I think a question for us to think about is, Again, we want to consider this. How have we experienced God's goodness in our lives? And recently, what are some things, what are some ways in which we have experienced the goodness and loving kindness of God? And to allow, again, to, to let that be a, a motivator for our own goodness. And then how can we, kind of going from here, thinking about the area of personal righteousness, meditating on goodness, injustice. How can we be more faithful in what we think about, right? And, and, and maybe we do an analysis of the things that we read, the things we watch, the things we click on on the computer, right? And, and think about, is this helping me to love my neighbor? Is this helping me to do good? And then in terms of justice, right? I think one question I want to ask is, have we grown up hearing that justice is an important call for Christians? And if not, how can we then help us be a part of our discipleship? So we realize that it's not just, you know, m you know, you, me, our Bibles, and God, but rather I mean, that we, we need that. But that our call extends even to those beyond our four walls, um, beyond simply the personal one-to-one -one interaction, but looking at the bigger societal level of things. So that's all tonight. I know we've gone a little later than normal, so let me say a brief word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would cultivate your fruit in us, that your spirit would work in our lives and transform us, to conform us to be to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in order that we might love one another well and accomplish the good works you've prepared for us. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>